Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to another episode of the Shots Fired podcast. This is episode 21, and we're your hosts. I'm Kyle, and this is Mark here, and we have a special guest joining us today. Uh, we were going to have a special guest on just to kind of mix it up a little bit, and last minute, Billy had to call in, and that's why he's not here with us today. Uh, he had to go to work, so we'll miss you, Billy, but uh, in the meantime, we have a guest with us, Justin. What's up, Justin? Uh, How's it going? Justin Good. Justin works with me and uh we'll for go ahead. you. For you right now. Technically, but Kyle's my boss. We'll, uh, <laughs> we'll go ahead and uh let you introduce yourself and um we'll go from there. So thanks for having me guys. Uh my name is Justin, I work with Kyle. I've uh, been in law enforcement for about ten years. Um held positions with our SIU, our special investigations unit, uh currently an FTO and assigned to as a corporal. So kind of the next next under Kyle. So I help him out with a lot of stuff. Is that That's true? Is that what a corporal is? It just, yeah. So um, I'll, you know, if Kyle's out of town or if there's something else going on, I can add in, I can do acting sergeant roles. Oh, uh, all right. Nice. That's about it. I think probably corporals are, I don't know. I would imagine probably the same um, everywhere at every agency, kind of like, you know, the next step of being a sergeant. Um, I don't know if that's how they were, where you work, but no corporals were another word for field training officer. Yeah. Oh, okay. I mean, but yours sounds like you have more responsibility. Sometimes. Yeah. Uh, yeah. The, I mean, right now with the hiring that we're doing, we, I usually have a trainee, but uh, you know, you already know that's my number one, uh, but you know, if Kyle's gone, then that's, then you're, yeah, like he's the number two yeah. guy. Like, yeah, oh, okay. For sure. Yeah. Next up. Nice. Yeah. So, right on. um, the corporals are like the sergeant's right hand man, which is nice because if you know, you got stuff going on or whatever, he can, he can go respond to calls and work an incident or whatever, and I can be somewhere else. And, oh. uh, you know, so he, and he helps out quite a bit. So he's also sitting on your right side. Yep. <laughs> yeah, he's just sitting on the right side. Yeah. He's sitting, he's sitting in the infamous <laughs> Billy's chair tonight. Yeah, yeah. So, Oh, Hey, thanks for uh, popping in dude. And, um, sitting in with us tonight. We, uh, we thought we'd kind of throw a little, little mix into the podcast and not do so much of an interview just with somebody else, but, um, maybe just have a special guest sit in with us and answer questions and, and just kind of have fun and I don't know, kind of just mix it up a little bit. So, um, we do have a lot of questions that, uh, people asked us to answer, um, that we asked, you know, on social media and then, and then of course on the YouTube channel. So we're going to dive into that, but before we do that, we didn't tell Justin we're doing this, but Justin, mm. <laughs> Justin for being the first special guest on the wow. show, we did get you a little gift. Does it go in my cup? No. Okay. <laughs> it's uh, your your item that is sitting on there. It's in that box. If you want to go ahead and pull that out. Uh-oh. Oh, 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 you got to open it on the table. Yeah, though. open it so table. everybody can see. Yeah, yeah. be care careful with that. Oh, my God. Keep it level. Keep it level. Fragile? Yeah, keep it level. It's glass. Is it a puppy? <laughs> no, it's definitely not a puppy. I know a good puppy story. Yeah, we, we, we do too, but we're not going to share that. Okay. No peeking. No peeking. <laughs> Just drop this over here. If you're not watching this on YouTube, you're you're missing out. Oh my gosh, it's beautiful. What All is right. it? Show show everybody. Oh. What it is. oh, I think I should put it on. Dang, that looks nice. Dang, look at that, dude. Show the camera. Your very own shots fired podcast sweatshirt, hoodie, sweater. Thank nice. you. Nice. You know, I was eyeballing those, and I was trying to figure out how I was going to steal Kyle's. Yeah, yeah. I like yeah. his. It's gray. It looks good. I hope it fits. Are you gonna I'm wear sure it? Will. Yeah, just or at least at least lay it on the table. Yeah, you don't have to there lay it on the table. No, there you go. Mark I think you too. should. It looks good. Mark yeah. said to I uh, respect my elders. You know, you're, there are, there's a lot of people jealous right <laughs> I now. I remember the, the the old episode where you guys were talking about his age. So yeah. Oh yeah. Well, we won't, he's we sixty. Won't dive back into it. Well, yeah, he is sixty, but he just looks, <laughs> well, you do look sixty, but you're actually Jeez. you're only forty. <laughs> <laughs> I am just thank you guys. I appreciate it. I'll yeah, wear it with pride. Yeah, you're right, right on. Man. All right, that's our first first gift giveaway, which a lot of people are jealous because a lot of people have been asking for these. So we're gonna give we some still, away. Yeah, think? we still need to do our giveaway. I tell you what, for our giveaway for the hooded sweater, let's do. Um, we'll do a drawing from comments in this video. Okay. 
whoever can lay out the best comment or give us the best comment or just any comment in general, we'll go through them all and do a random winner. Um, or if you do a terrifically good comment and make us laugh, then you're the winner. So I like it. But they, have, they have to be followers, right? Um, you better be subscribed to the channel and, uh, sense. yeah, it does. Yeah. And you know, follow us on social media and then, uh, yeah, leave us, leave us a comment in the, in the YouTube video and we may pick you. How about that? We'll mail, like you, it. We'll mail you a hooded sweater. I like it. Yeah. So, there you go. Right that on. our giveaway. We got to get rid of them quick because it's going to be summertime soon and nobody's going to want to wear them. Yeah, that's true. But we can make t-shirts. I mean, whatever. Maybe we'll come up with a cool, cooler design. I like this one. I like the design. Yeah. I mean, it's all right. So there you have it. There's your gift. All right. So to kick this episode off, we asked all of you to send us some good questions that you had, um, on Instagram. And then we had some on YouTube and private messages and whatnot. We decided that we're going to go through those questions, answer them. A lot of them are actually pretty good questions. Um, some we've discussed in prior episodes, but, um, we'll, we'll rehash them and maybe go more in depth with it. But, um, let's kick that off and, uh, let's see here. What do you got for us? Let's start out with our questions from Instagram. All right. Speaking of Instagram, I have yet to have someone hit me up on my Instagram. Like, like in what way? That's a good question because like I don't, just, like I don't really know how Instagram works. So maybe I have been hit up and I <laughs> don't. Can't track well, it down. He yeah. Actually, yeah. So like Mark will have messages in his inbox or whatever, but you know, he'll, he'll ask me, how does this work? And, and he'll be like, I don't have any messages. And then I'll click, I'll have him show me. And I'm like, no, you do. Like you have to actually click on the messages. So I think yeah. part, part of that's your fault. Yeah, I'll, I'll accept that. But what you're saying is you want more people to message, message you and ask you questions if they have them. I guess what it's, what it's coming down to is I'd like to be able to check a message with I think confidence. Was, I, I think what it comes down to is you, you just made an Instagram for the first time and now you're addicted to it already. I, what's, what questions you got? Yeah. <laughs> I think you just want to know that people hold, hold you in a high standard. Like yeah. Kyle. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like, Kyle's got to, don't just talk to Kyle. Talk to me. <clears throat> yeah. There's, I do, encourage, us, I do encourage that. Yeah. Please. So what do you got? Okay, let's start out with uh, question number one, and that is, um, what is your guys' remaining career goals at our agencies? Um, uh, Justin, why don't you go first and answer that, and I'll go. Um, I'm kind of torn. You know, I have about 10 years on, like I said, and kind of at that area where I'm possibly promote. Um, I'm yeah. on, on a list right now. It's set to expire, so I'm okay with that. But uh, I don't know, testing for motors right now, see if I get that. Um, and just kind of all around, I, I, I currently love what I do. I mean, I think that it's super important to have people in positions that are training the upcoming officers. Uh, so like patrol and FTO. Yeah, in patrol, yeah. FTO, the corporal spot, you know, I get a, I kind of get a little, a little taste of everything with that. Yeah. Hmm. Get the opportunity to, um, you know, kind of guide some of these younger people in a direction to where they are successful, not only successful, but safe. That's, yeah. that's obviously, you know, priority number one. I agree. So I, I would say in the next, you know, three to four years, maybe look to promote. Yeah. And you've got to do some other fun assignments before yeah. when you were. I mean, SIU was a lot of fun. Yeah. I mean, we, it's a small unit close. I mean, like Billy knows he, yeah. cl close, close, good group of guys that understand each other. Nothing even needs to be said and you know, what's going to be done. Yeah. So, yeah, I do. I, I agree with you on the, uh, like training the, the new guys up. I didn't get to do a whole lot of it. I, I did it more so for like the canine guys, but. It, it is cool, like being able to, I don't know, like see these guys start knowing nothing and then, you know, bring them up. And some of them, a lot of them end up being really successful. And I would imagine you're kind of like, man, I trained that guy. It's kind of cool. It, it's, it, it is a little, a little bit of sense of pride. Right. But I, I never agreed with or liked the idea of a canine officer being an FTO. Yeah. We you don't do that. You have so much to task with just working your dog and watching your dog and, mm. I mean, you're accountable for what, what your trainee is doing. Yeah. So if they're off, you know, if they're putting themselves in a bad situation, you need to be able to adjust that. Mm -hmm. But if you also have a, a four-legged friend out and about, you're responsible for that as well. I think if you're 
good FTO, people still remember you. I, oh, to dude, this oh, day, I hope so. in a good way. <laughs> yeah, to this yeah. day, my very first training officer was an RT. Uh, What's he, RT? Reg, um, for Sacramento, they have regional transit. It's like a public transportation, buses mm -hmm. and trains. And they had officers assigned to that, uh, that unit specifically to monitor that. And when I came on, they had a, uh, one of the guys was a training officer and I rode with him for the first six weeks working trains and buses and platforms. And the guy was awesome. To the, literally to this day, he's, he's one of my most favorable uh, FDS. Really? Yeah. And you, wow. That's kind of shocking just because you weren't working the streets, but I mean, if you less we, up, Well, know. everything we did was proactive. Everything was a, virtually a consensual contact. Yeah. So. so yeah, no, I, I, I FT, agree. FTOs are I, huge. I, yeah, I remember some of my good FTOs when I first started, and, you know, and that was 15 years ago. In fact, some of the, some things I do today, even as a supervisor, I mean, I learned from my FTOs, you know, 15 years ago. So I, I definitely agree with you on that. And we did an episode already on bad FTOs where you remember them too, and you're like, yeah. I'll never be like that guy as an FTO. Yeah, whether it's things you say or things you do or how yeah. you act. Yeah, so... So for me to answer the question, uh, career goals, you know, right, right now, I mean, I just promoted a year and a half ago. So, you know, kind of learning the role of a, of a Sergeant, uh, which is a lot, a lot of responsibility, ton of fun. Um, like you, I love patrol and currently that's obviously what I'm doing now. Uh, we work graveyards together, but I enjoy that. I think my, I think right now what I'm focusing on is probably trying to go into a specialty assignment, run a specialty kind of figure that out. And then obviously from there, you know, go maybe bump up to a, uh, to Lieutenant in a few years, maybe within, maybe that'd be like my five year goal. But, um, right now I just want to, I want to get into a specialty outside of patrol and, and do something I haven't done before. So, and, uh, Mark, you're retired. So I am, but I still had my <laughs> end goal to, to, for the question. Like, what did I want to end on? I wanted to be a cold case homicide detective. That's what I wanted to That'd do. Cool. And that I would be cool. What I thought would be really rewarding about that is a homicide and Billy chases those homicide suspects, mm -hmm. which he's doing tonight. But you have a homicide and that suspect, say it's a gang member, that's their lifestyle. They're involved in gangs. Like they've grown, maybe grown up that way, that they're associated. They commit a murder. Billy's team goes after them or other teams two, three, four weeks later. At the longest, they get arrested and then they serve time. They go to prison. That's their lifestyle. Like they're used to that. That's credibility, I guess, in a way for prison. And then however long they serve, then they get out. Cold case, what I thought was super interesting is they commit a murder. They get away with it. Maybe they're a gang member or something. And years go by and maybe they fade from that criminal aspect. And maybe they start a family. Maybe they get back into doing like, actual jobs and maybe they're fifties or sixties and they have kids. And then a team comes, finds out who it is and arrests that person. And now there's a major effect and that, uh, it's a ripple effect. And that I think is more emotional for the families to arrest that person because that suspect is now has lost something when they're a gang member and, and they're in, in the middle of this, maybe they don't really lose anything, but when you're, out of the game and you have a family, you may lose something. And I think that is about, would be really rewarding. That's what I wanted to do. I think, I think that would be cool. I, even if you weren't a gangbanger, um, never thought of it that way. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, Jeez. You really thought about this. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. There used to be a TV show. It was the homicide hunter and he talked about a or cold. I'm sorry. Uh, my mistake. The, the TV show was actually cold case mm -hmm. I know a long time ago. And it was really cool to see the very ending when they they're walking these people that are in their fifties and sixties that have families and they're walking them out to serve prison time for the rest of their life. And now their life has been affected mm -hmm. where you walk a normal homicide suspect that's just committed a murder. Eh, I don't know. You know? Yeah. Well, no, that'd be cool. I think it's also something that, you know, Billy's chasing guys that they know they just did something very bad. Yes. Their guards up. I mean, years, decades pass, their guards going to drop. They're going to be a little more relaxed. And then all of a sudden mm -hmm. that pass is going to come back and haunt them a little bit. Oh, yeah, for sure. That's yeah. what I want to do. That cool would case. be cool. Speaking along those lines, I'm, I'm trying to work on, um, getting somebody to come on the show and we can interview about the golden state killer. Um, because he lived in our city that we work in. And I mean, that, that made national news 
Um, yeah, I, every, I mean, now if you guys don't know who the Golden State Killer is, I would research it. Uh, he was a ser- serial killer back in the 80s. Was it the 80s? It was late 70s, early 80s. Yeah, yeah 70s, 80s. Um, very fascinating story. Killed, I mean, dozens and dozens of women. Raped up upwards in the 50s plus women all throughout the whole state of California, uh, which is why he got dubbed the Golden State Killer. And lo and behold, just a couple of years ago, he's in his 80s, I think. I think he's in his 80s. I don't know. I'll have to look, but yeah. I don't think he's that old. I think he's late 70s. Late yeah, 70s. I don't think it was. Yeah. But he's old. I mean, the guy's old, old now, right? He's in his late 70s, and he just got arrested for all those crimes, and he happened to live in the city we work in. And I remember I remember that day when he got arrested. I mean, you're talking the FBI. Um, I mean, huge yeah. teams of people. We didn't even know about it when yeah. they swooped in. Yeah, on I remember him. they didn't put anybody's name out there. They were Nothing. just like, Hey, we got, they, they blocked off the units in the yeah, area. They, they blocked off Leave the us in, alone. <laughs> yeah. They blocked off the whole <laughs> block when they hit that guy's house and, and finally arrested him all those years later. And there's been TV shows about it. Um, documentaries about it. Um, and uh, I think it would be really cool if we did an episode you know, interviewing, I know there was a couple of detectives that worked that case all the way through and they're obviously retired now. Yeah. And, um, I think it'd be cool to have them on and do some little segment. You know, uh, he had a boat where his house was, he yeah. had a little fishing boat. Yeah. It was parked down. Oh yeah. We, we went to his house. I mean, I, so I want to say it was just two days after his arrest. Uh, he lived with his wife at the time. She went and stayed somewhere else. Um, Boston, Chris Boston, who was what was on our show, um, he and I responded to an alarm at his house just a couple of days after his arrest. And man, I tell you what, what an what an eerie thing! Like going to that house, uh, walking his property, knowing he was the Golden State Killer. And obviously, I, I had known about this serial killer growing up. But um, what a trip, man! You know, getting to go to his house and check on an alarm call there. But uh, yeah, he his fishing boat was out there. You know what the name of it was? Uh, no. What was it? I think it was, I think he called it scary. I think the boat was called scary. Really? Yeah. And it came out in court and people were like, oh, that makes sense. God damn. Yeah. That'd be a cool guest though. One Dude, of those detect- totally. Right? Of ties into. I mean, we could go, we could even or... re- film like out. I mean, we're, I, where his house is. We know exactly where his house is. I mean, um, they get sent sold, but yeah. Yeah. I think they, I don't know what they did with it, but he lived there the entire time. Like he's lived there that, that entire time after he, did all these, uh, homicides and what, whatnot, um, lived in our city. I know he bounced around California, moved around, um, and then ended up moving into that house where he's at now. He's been there for years, but ironically enough, he was a police officer when this whole thing started here locally at an agency, not far from us. And, uh, he got fired. He got fired. Yeah. He got fired for, uh, stealing like a hammer, some duct tape, like basically a rape kit. (laughs) Um, from a local store yeah. as a police officer gets fired for, for theft, for like petty theft, um, this whole time. I mean, that's the the story's crazy. If you haven't heard of it, go look it up. The golden state killer. It's pretty, pretty interesting. Um, but we're, we are, I want to try to work on maybe getting somebody that can come on the show that can, that can talk about that investigation. I think that'd be awesome. It just, that reminded me, uh, since you said that, because well, I think, mean, think of the, <clears throat> how that guy was affected his life, the family, like all that massive. Oh dude. He's got daughters who are, you know, adults, um, his so wife, I mean, they all kids had, and- yeah, they have, they had no idea that that's who their dad was. And the crazy thing is like, everybody knows about that case generally, especially if you live here in California. Well, if you're in the Sacramento area, you knew that for sure. People were freaked out. Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah, definitely. Do you, do you recall how they, how they actually got caught him yeah through the it, i mean it's that cold for years yeah the uh an, ancestry ancestry.com whatever yeah the, the mitochondria yeah. i think it's called mitochondrial dna so basically mm. like the somebody put their like DNA 23 and me yeah. and they found it and they got it they narrowed it down to like mm. i want to say like a handful of suspects potentially and they knew some things about this person so they were able to narrow it down to a really narrow field of people um so the, Wow. That's crazy. Yeah. Crazy. The, the technology, all those the, years the later, the ability to just yeah. 
I mean, tracked people down through yeah, somebody else's website. DNA, essentially. It was like, yeah, one of his family, long, like a distant family member, but pretty wild story. Uh, made me think of that uh, since you brought that up. I mean, you know, obviously they interviewed dozens of victims who survived the whole ordeal. I mean, he would break into these folks' homes at night in the middle of the night. Well, don't I, spoil the story. Okay. All right. Because well, there's a movie about it. Okay. Then go, go check it out. But um, the families, all these years later, children of the women that were raped and whatnot, I mean, devast you know, devastated. They were, um, it was a pretty traumatic thing when he just recently got arrested. I mean, all those emotions got re rehashed. Victims had to testify. Um, pretty, pretty big ordeal. So we'll work on that. I think that'd be awesome for an episode. Um, anyway, so what else that, you got? Hopefully that answers your question. That was a little long winded. Let's see here. Um, tips on getting small departments to lose the, how we've always done it mindset. That is a really good question. Um, Mark, you want to kick that one off and uh, we'll go around the table. I, I like that question because I don't like that. Yeah, I think you might answer. I'll, I'll definitely try an answer, but I think you might have a better insight because I've never worked for a That's small true. agency. That's I worked true. for a big agency, but I, I like the fact that whoever's posing this question probably works in a small agency and wants to change it and doesn't like it. And I like it, or I don't like that, but I like the fact that he's- The idea to try to yes. know, make changes. Yeah, yeah. and yeah. The, what I could recommend is everyone that you work with and know to reach out and get- training outside of your apartment. Like mm -hmm. look at any type of training that you feel survival training. You, you run that company, like hit us up or hit you up to yeah. try and have someone come in and teach that. But if you can get any type of training outside of your department, I think opens that box and you should never, never limit that. That's all I can really say on that. Cause I haven't worked in a small department. I don't know what the culture is like. I, I do agree with you. Um, that's a, that's a, very bad mindset to have, you know, like we, this is why we do it because that's how we've always done it. And I have worked with both of us, uh, both started at a small agency. Oh, yours is even smaller. Yeah. It was tiny. It yeah. was me and me and one other officer on. And that was, that was the shit. We didn't have a sergeant on most of the time. It was, uh, you know, like a senior lead officer kind of thing. Me and one person, that was it. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, wow. you, you came from smaller than me, but, and you can touch on this as well from your perspective, but I can actually vividly recall, I get, I got, I remember getting on the SWAT team at my old agency and, and the team leader at the time, um, good dude, but you know, grew up in that culture. And, uh, when me and another guy went off to SWAT school, we went off to like a more newer, I don't know, kind of more up to date SWAT school. And when we came back and we're like, well, these are the tactics that we were taught, um, you know, which was different than what we were doing, but it made more sense. Obviously, uh, you know, obviously tactics are always, um, advancing and we kind of got, we got shut down and it was like, well, no, this is, this is how we've done it. And this is how we've always done it. And, um, I remember that being a battle. It was kind of like, well, it doesn't really make sense. We're doing it this way when we could be doing it this way, which is far more safe. Um, so I, I, I for sure came from a department with that culture and I don't not, and I don't want to say anything bad about them. I'm, I'm like super grateful for where I started from. And I, I love all the guys that I worked with, even my bosses, I just think it's small departments. Um, you, I think you nailed it on the head where they're not branching outside of their, their comfort zone. Um, as far as training, usually a lot of that stuff is more kind of internal. It's, it's in house. And, um, I think you're right. I think inviting folks or inviting people from the outside in, into your world, um, opens your, opens your eyes a little bit to a different perspective. Um, and then it just comes down to admin is, has to be willing to, um, accept that and kind of embrace it. And then, and then tell their people like, Hey, like show them that we want to grow and advance and not, not just stick to currently what you're doing, you know, especially if it's to me, to me, I look at like tactics and, and things like that. Like those are more relevant in my opinion, just because of the safety component yeah. to it. Um, you know, go, go seek training outside your department. Uh, if you have to pay for it on your own, can, I would encourage you to do that. Um, you know, invite those people into your, into your own world, uh, into your own, own department and do it. But, um, and that, yeah, that's a shitty spot to be in because if you're a, if you're a line level officer and you're trying to get your bosses to 
change how they've done things probably for years at that small department. That's a tough battle, I think, to win. <laughs> but um, I think if you just keep keep putting the pressure on and just keep uh, keep ha- hammering away at it, I think you'll you'll slowly chip it away at the culture. You know, the thing with culture is um, building culture takes a very long time to do. You cannot create new culture overnight. It just doesn't happen. Um, you got to keep chipping away at it. You can, however, kill culture, I think, overnight, you know, so... Um, but to build culture into a, into a new, maybe better thing, it, it does take, a, it does take a long time and you just can't get frustrated with it and you can't expect it to happen overnight. Um, it is going to take a while. So I would just keep chipping away at it and I don't know, keep, keep doing what you're doing. If you're trying to advance yourself and go to, go to trainings and stuff. I mean, uh, yeah. I mean, I think trainings are really important because obviously at a small agency, there's only you're limited on oh, yeah. typically budget wise. Um, you're, you know, most small agencies, small cities, small populations. And your exposure to things is a yeah. lot, a lot smaller, right? You're not exposed to the big city. No. So stuff. when I got into law enforcement, obviously everybody has this grand idea of what they want to do and how they want to be a cop and how impactful they want to be. And uh, back when I got started on it, there wasn't a lot of agencies hiring. So, um, I was lucky enough to get offered a job at a small agency that paid me <laughs> rather than a reserve position. Yeah. Um, and I was commuting back and forth. It was about an hour and 20 minutes each way. And, but I was, I was very happy and I'm very happy where I'm at and grateful for the opportunity that was given to me by the chief of police at that agency. Um, but it was very much so this is the way we do it. And this is, but there wasn't a why it was just a, this is how we do it. Mm-hmm. Um, and knowing what I know now, um, I don't believe that they were doing it intentionally, but there was some yeah. stuff where they were out of compliance with the law. Um, you know, when it comes to like missing persons and research and the investigation that needs to take place for at risk, um, you know, things that could potentially come back and, you know, potentially be an issue yeah. for the yeah. li- li- especially liability wise. Yeah, yeah, liability. I mean, that's what that's one of the big issues in our in in this career, right? Um, and I also think it comes down to complacency. You know, you're. I think you kind of have two is two two kind of camps when it comes to these smaller agencies. You got the old guys. Um, no offense, Mark. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> that that are you know they just. I'm a protected class, just so you know. <laughs> <laughs> not here, you're not. <laughs> That's true. Um, you know that love what they do. Maybe you have a lot of ties into the city, whether they live in the city or live nearby. But uh, I probably go. A lot of people know them by their first name. Yeah. You know, mm-hmm. that's not officer so-and-so, that's Joe. Yeah. Um, yeah. And then you got the younger guys that are just green and coming into a job, which um, are thankful for that job, but maybe aren't learning what they can't, what, what they're capable of learning. Uh, I didn't feel like a police officer. Looking back on it, what I do now, what I've learned since being where I'm at for the last seven years versus what I was doing there, I honestly felt more like a community service officer, which yeah. is not a knock on the city, which is not a knock on the agency. Um, but I didn't feel like I was reached my potential or going to reach my potential. Yeah. Um, but I, I mean, I would say, yeah, keep going to trainings, keep working, keep encouraging officers to, you know, be successful at what they're doing, point out the flaws in the system, you know, by not saying anything, you're not going to change anything, point out the flaws, point out why they're flawed, not just, Hey, this is broken. This is broken because of this. Yeah. And this is the fix. Mm-hmm. You know, I always tell my trainees, have a reason for what you're doing. Don't just say, I don't know. That's what somebody told me to do. Even, have a reason for what you're doing. So even how, even if, it, sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off. Like, even if it was the wrong thing, but as long as you can, if you're like, hey, why did you do that? And they give you an answer. Absolutely. Like, wh- like why they thought it was the right thing. Cool. It's a decision. Yeah. It's, it's a it's a reason for what you did. Yeah, exactly. Make a decision. I, I think I, that's the difference is of an excuse versus a reason. Mm-hmm. Like if you're, if you ask, Hey, well, why did you do that? And they give you, and they tell you why they did it. I think that's respectable because yeah. that's, that's, that's a reason why they did it. It could be totally wrong and fucked up and not right at all, but that's a reason versus an excuse where they're making shit up. Yeah. yeah. That's I, the problem. So I, I think circling back to the, you know, what, the agencies that are, uh, that have the mind frame of like, they do things the way they do it because that's how they've always done it. Like, I think if you start questioning, like you said, the why behind it, 
um, and then present maybe a new way to do things. Um, that's kind of, I think how you start slowly shifting the culture of your department. Um, I know, I know that happened at my old department. I know a lot of things they were doing, but when I was there, um, <clears throat> like you said, probably some of it wasn't up, up to date mm-hmm. and we were outside of posts and all that. You know, I, I know, I, I almost know for a fact that like they don't operate like that anymore because, you know, they have the younger officers that have moved up in rank and they understand that philosophy. Yeah. And so they're slowly making those changes. But yeah, I mean, I mean, it's a, I don't think it's something you're going to change overnight. Um, don't buy into that philosophy though, because that's obviously a dangerous area to operate in. But, um, you know, doing things just because that's the way they've always done it. Go to training bring it to your department, show them the why. If that means you have to go to your chief and say, Hey chief, I took this training and I want to, I want to do a department training or do these trainings in your briefings and show, show the guys or gals why, what you want to bring to the table is better than what you're already doing. Uh, you're probably gonna have to stick your neck out a little bit, but as long as you can explain it and show that it's better, I think people will start to jump on your bandwagon and, and then eventually you'll start noticing your culture change. I agree. Um, especially if it comes down to officer safety. For sure. You know, tactics, when it, definitely. When, when you're looking at tactics and officer safety at a small agencies, you sacrifice a lot. Dude, and yeah. For for what is what it boils down to. Uh, what, yep. You know, c- can you can you slow it down? Can you do something safer? Yeah. And, you know, maybe increase that officer safety. Yeah, a lot of this stuff can be talked about, should be talked about in briefings. I know we do it a lot. Um that's how you really shift people's mind frame is uh, having these discussions. And then obviously we talk about doing debriefs after calls or whatever debrief stuff. Um, and you, I think you'll see a shift in your culture if you, if you, um, if you do those things, but that's a good question. Yeah, it was. Um, all right. What have you found to be uh, the best way to separate work from home and have a, a work life balance? Um, again, that's, it's a good, fair question. Um, I, I'll answer that first. I would say, um, I think a lot of cops probably more so early on let this job like define them and they, they let this job and career define who they are. And I would say, and, and I'm guilt and I would say I'm, I'm guilty of that because I started so young in this career that I, I think I fell into that trap. Um, you know, you, you cannot let this job define who you are. Um, you know, especially outside of work, like me as a father, um, you know, I have a significant other, like that's, I let my family life define who I am. Um, not, not what I do for work. And I think once you get that understanding, it becomes a lot easier, you know? So, um, I know we've mentioned it before, but like, outside of work, not just always hanging out with your buddies from work or, you know, when you are hanging out with your buddies from work, you're constantly talking about work. Um, that, that, that there's a time and a place for that, but that also could be become very unhealthy. And, um, when you're just, when that's all you're doing away from work is you're hanging out with your coworkers and you're talking about work and, you know, you're trying to play cop outside of work. I think that becomes very unhealthy I think it's hard too because I think a lot of people look at what we do and want to know, okay, like, hey, what's new? What? Tell me a good story. Tell me this. Even the non-law enforcement. Yeah. Um, so I think it's important to have perspective. You know, don't be rude. Obviously, don't be an asshole. Sure. But you know, give them an answer and tell them, hey, you know, want to come out and ride? Let's go do it. Let's go have some fun. Um, but hey, let's talk about this. So let's do that. Um, I was married five years before getting into law enforcement, so it was a big change at home. Um, I remember through the academy, I was sleeping in a separate room because I had to wake up so early. I had a light on a timer. I had an alarm clock on it, obviously <laughs> set. I was paranoid to be late. Like, well, yeah, I, I did not too. want to be that guy <laughs> running up yeah. late to the academy. Unfortunately, it never was. Um, but I, I, there's going to be changes. Um, mentally, you kind of adapt in life and you become more aware of what's going on around you. Um but I think it's important not to go so far down that to where your, you know, resting heart rate is 85 beats per minute. And you know, you're yeah. in this paranoia state. What, what do you guys think? Um, you know, there's the saying like, uh, and we were told this in the Academy, um, you know, you're, you're a cop 24 seven, like outside of work, 
Like you're always, you're always a cop, right? I mean, I really bought into that in the beginning of my career. And I can honestly say like now I, I would, I, I don't, I don't really agree with that. Um, I, I understand what my job is and I understand my capabilities and, you know, as far as like the authority that I have outside of work, I, I totally get that. Um, but the whole additive additive of like, oh, you're a cop 24 seven. I don't, I don't like that. And honestly, I don't like, I don't like telling guys that or gals, um, especially new in, in this job, you know, you have to have a life outside of this job. And it's, it's definitely not a job where you can just show up and put in 10 hours a, a day or 12 hours a day and just go home. Like that's, I'm not saying that either. And we've also talked about that because this job is so such high risk, you know, but outside of, of j the work, like, man, I, I have a boat. Like I go to the lake, I go freaking take the kids out, me and Steph, like, you know, go traveling around. I mean, man, when I'm not at work, like I disassociate myself from work, pr I think pretty good as we're sitting here doing a podcast on law enforcement, <laughs> you're stupid being a hypocrite. Right. But no, but honestly, um, <clears throat> I think society, I think you gotta be careful. Yeah. But society kind of pushes that direction because society looks at like doctors, lawyers, cops, like that's what they think about when you go to a party, when you meet people for the first time in a social setting, if something comes up, it's generally, Oh, he's the cop or he's mm -hmm. a cop. And it's, yeah, I don't right. think it's necessarily like a negative thing. I think people are like intrigued. Yeah. So then it, like you said, it does kind of spark like, Oh dude, no way. Like, tell me a story. Mm -hmm. So I think society in itself kind of makes it really hard, mm -hmm. but, and then just some other things. Like w when I was on the SWAT team, I had a take home car. Like I literally sold my personal car and this was my assigned car. And I drove it literally every day on my days off constantly. I had a gas card and that's what I used. Mm -hmm. But one thing I did do is I made sure that there's nothing police related in the car, like inside the, the compartment, like the driver and the passenger in the back seats, mm -hmm. everything was organized in my trunk. That way it was like a normal car and I could drive around. It's just unmarked with cowlicks and plates but I knew a lot of guys on the team that would have their uniforms hanging on their back seat. They'd have like their boots on the back floorboard, like all their shit, like they were working, but yet they drove it every day with their families. And I think that's hard to dis. Some of them left their laptops on the mounts in the center console. And I think that's hard to disassociate, but doing, like you said, outside of work stuff, I always tried to, I, I got sucked into being, that one that was all about law enforcement, but I still had a core group and to this day, a core group of friends that were not cops that really kept me grounded. Yeah. And I'm not saying you can't have friends. Like I, I have a small, I have a tight group of friends that are also cops, but we know that, that when we're away from work and we hang out with each other, like we're, we'll talk about each other's kids, like wives, you know, hang out. Like we really don't talk about work. Um, I, I guess my answer would just be, you just got to be really careful with it. Yeah. Don't, don't talk let about it, it. Don't let it consume you. Do not let this job define you. And you know, one day when you are not this job anymore and you never know when that's going to happen, <laughs> you can get injured, whatever. Right. Like, um, it'll be a struggle. It'll yeah, be a struggle. So it, don't make it part of your life. Exactly. You're outside your work. Yeah. So good question. Yeah. It, it's a good question. Um, yeah. I mean, that's, that's kind of all yeah. I have to say about it. I mean, I think it's also too important to, include your significant other. I don't know if the yeah. subject asking the question, no, but that's is a good married, point. but you know, obviously, you know, you have a, we're calling it a bad day, a busy day or an event that happens on while you're on duty. That's, that's impactful. It's tough to just shed that and leave it behind at the office and not bring it home. Mm -hmm. um, so I think it's important to have established that relationship with your significant other to include them to an extent. I think that gets fucking crazy too, because when you come home and you have an attitude or something, granted, there are times I get it, but, and they're like, what did you do? And you're like, well, fuck, I got in this pursuit and I chased this dude and I went over the fence and like <clears throat> tackled this guy and I batoned him and I fucked my back up. And then like later on I took this, like, and then you're like, so how was your day? And they're like, uh, <laughs> like, yeah. I think that's pretty fucked. <laughs> so I think, yeah. I mean, it's important to be, have that relationship, but then also like, how much? Yeah. I don't know. It's such a weird balancing act. 
I just give her yeah. little nuggets every now and then. There you go. Yeah. There, there you go. go. Maybe yeah. just one story. Yeah. Or, I like it. It's fine. Yeah. Yeah. I'm pretty, pretty mellow when it comes to that. Like I, I just, I generally don't talk about it, but if someone asks, I may throw, like you said, throw a nugget. But like, if I go to an event or whatever and people are like, Oh dude, like how was work or whatever? I'm, uh, my answer nine out of 10 times is just like, Oh, it's all right. Like, yeah, we're, we've been busy. And I just, I shut it down. And, and then I think that kind of shuts them down. Um, obviously if people want to keep going and going, I'll, I'll do what Justin said. And, um, I'll be like, Hey dude, if you want to do a ride along, like just do a ride along. If you want to know what it's like, yeah. come, come hang out. I'll, I'll take you. So do you guys have fake jobs that you tell random people that you do? Hell yeah. What is it? Uh, construction. Construction. Cause I, cause I can talk about it. Cause what I talk enough about it. What type can, of construction? Yeah, bullshit your way through well, it. Well, so my dad was a painter. No, no, I'm asking you what type of construction do you do? <laughs> See, you're already fucking it up. No. Jesus. I'm disappointed. Dude, I'll be like, I'm a carpenter. Yeah, but that's so broad. I'm a framer. No one would ever say that. I'm a framer. I used to frame houses and, and I never said I was a framer. Well, if someone said, what's your, what's your trait or whatever? What size can, hammer do you swing? 12 inch. <laughs> <laughs> Liar. <laughs> Could you actually talk Joyce and all that? Um, you can't see you're already stuttering. Okay, fucking fine. get a better story. Okay, Jesus fine. Christ. You're I'm 15 a, years in. I'm a painter. Okay. Like Picasso or like, no, like paint houses. Oh, okay. I can, oh. I'll talk. My dad, my dad owns a painting company. I grew up painting houses and shit with him. So you work for I'll your dad? Switch yeah, absolutely. To Picasso. <laughs> see, yep. switch it. there you I go. Talk about what painter. you know. Paint houses. Mark, how about you? Yeah. What did I do? No. Do you have like a bullshit story that you tell people? Like I, I got a funny one. I can go into a little I bit. did. I worked construction. So you say construction. Yeah. And I used to frame. <laughs> <laughs> no, but plumb and line. That's a okay. specific trait within construction, plumb and line. Once people frame the house, then you go in and you make sure the walls are plumb. Level is horizontal. Plumb is up and down. Thank you. See. Thank you. And you make the walls plumb and then that way they're long and straight and then you brace the house so then they can load it with the... Um, the trusses. Well, let's be honest. People don't go that far. In. Yeah. They they, yeah. You just they're say construction. Like, hey, they're like, Oh, cool. What do like, you do for construction? Yeah. But if they ask and you happen to get asked by a dude that works construction, you're going to be fucked. So you better know what the hell you're talking about. Yeah. yeah. I, or just say I'm in school. I'm going to college. <laughs> well, they'll know you're we wrong because you can't fucking talk about it. Whatever, yeah. dude. <laughs> Justin, what's what, your story? Yeah, what's your story? Year, Sierra. Yeah. So, <laughs> so, uh, one day my wife and I were flying back from, I think it was, we were coming back from vacation, sitting on a plane on the, on the runway, landed, ready to get to the, uh, what's it called? Where we offload, right? The airport? <laughs> no. <laughs> where it's what the, the fuck? The tarmac, the tunnel, where they, where they park. I don't, oh, okay. I don't know. Yeah. And uh, so I'm on the aisle, my wife's in the middle, and there's this guy on the window. And That's nice you put her in the middle. Good work. I, well, yeah. <laughs> That's <laughs> fucking dick, but go. But keep going. She's a small gal. She, she fits better. <laughs> This guy in this, I, looking back on it, it was probably a bad decision because this guy was kind of a weirdo or presumed weirdo. <laughs> um, he didn't say a word the entire flight. And then we land and he starts talking. I'm like, gosh. So he's a long truck driver and he's coming here to Sacramento to pick up a 18 wheeler to drive it back to like Oklahoma or something like that. Hmm. And I don't pass judgment, but he was odd. He had like nylons on and cut off jeans. Yeah, that's weird. Like a leather vest and a leather hat. Just just not the way that I would like someone that I'd be like, hey, yeah. let's go grab a beer. Yeah. Um, so we get to talking and he asked, what do I do? And kind of going back to what you're doing, you have to know a little bit, right? I said waste management. And somehow this lady behind me was eavesdropping. She said, my husband works for waste management in Sacramento. <laughs> yeah. are you, and just starts diving into, are you with the union? What? Blah, blah, blah. I'm like, oh, shit. Do uh, you know? Keep going. Sorry. And so I've like made up some quick bullshit story. That, no, I just got hired. Haven't become a union member. What's your husband's name? And like, oh, I'll say hi if I recognize him. Well, but yeah, I mean, you got you to gotta have some background. I fucking know about garbage trucks. There's six type of garbage trucks. Boom. What do you want to know? Oh my God. <laughs> Seriously. There's a rear loader. There's the Evo, the front loader, the double truck, the fucking transfer. You probably would have made a better garbage truck driver than. Well, my buddy is a, uh, is a garbage truck driver. Two of them are my fucking absolute best friends to this grew up with these guys. I wish I did. Cause then I wouldn't have looked. Yeah. Like and they fire. know, and they have fucking cooler stories than I can come up with about trash stuff. And oh, it's, I bet. It's funny, but there's six type of garbage trucks. Just oh, pretty interesting. And, yeah. and shout out to garbage truck drivers because 
those guys do work that nobody else wants to do. I will I, tell I, you, I always give those guys a shout out. If you have trash, trash service at your house, Christmas time, tip your tip your drivers or Absolutely. put some candies or something on their yeah. on their tra- on their. It doesn't stuff. have to be anything big. We give them some, we give them a Christmas present every single yeah. Year. yeah. And it's, beer or whatever. Well, we can't do that one. You the can. Other, the other one that I take care of is Amazon drivers. We do that. Because we holidays, order yeah. a lot of stuff on Amazon. Yeah. Um, and it's the little things, right? It's the little things. A little bag life. of yeah. chips or rock. Yeah. Like Steph did that this year. Left on the porch. Just drive by. He's like, hey, dude, it's hot. Here's a here's an energy drink and. Right on. That's you. cool. I like it. Yeah. So there's your there's your tip. Always have a backup story when you don't want to tell people <laughs> what you do for work, but know what you're talking about. All right, moving on. Oh, let's see here. Um, my dad has been in law enforcement for 21 years and tells me it's not their career to get into right now. What are your thoughts? I'm assuming this person probably wants to get into law enforcement. Um, Justin, what do you think? Um, I would say dad's probably a little jaded. You know, he's probably been in the career. Was there? He's been a cop for 21 years. For 21 years. So he's seen the changes in law enforcement. Yeah. And, um, like I said, probably a little jaded. Probably it's not what it was, so therefore mm-hmm. don't do it now. Become a fireman. Um, I would say that. that if, <laughs> I would say that if it's something that you you feel, I think this is kind of a calling. Like I said, I, I started a little later in life. I didn't get into it until I was about thirty. Mm-hmm. Um, had a career before that, and just one day came home and said, "This is what I want to do." I had great support from my wife, and so I did it. Um, I would say do it. Yeah, do it. I agree. It, it, if it's gonna make, if it's going to make you happy. And you feel like that's what you're meant to do, do it. Ultimately, your dad's going to support you. Yeah, um, he will. You know, I think he'd be proud too. But don't be so prideful that you can't ask him questions. Um, learn from the man. He's obviously been doing it a long time, mm-hmm. doing it safely, I'm sure. Um, learn from him and maybe teach him a few things. Yeah. Yeah, I think I, think I would ask him why. Like, give me some specific reasons why you don't want me to be a cop. Well, let's just let's I, just assume that it's for all the rhetoric and what well, is, and, and, the, yeah, and so. your parents is realistically looking out for you. Yeah, it, their job is to protect you, like you're the child, like regardless of your age and how old they are, that you're their kid. They want to protect you and keep you safe, and they know it's a dangerous job, and they've seen horrific stuff, mm-hmm. and they don't want their kid to be exposed to that. But that's yeah. why I would ask your parent specific like why would you not want me to be a cop and let them tell you and then you can answer that like i appreciate that but this is what i'm i fucking idolize you i look up to you like i want to fall in like that's pretty admirable yeah and i would even go as far as to say like probably doesn't want you to because of how 21 years ago when your dad started i mean shit even when i started 15 years ago like the way policing is is 100 percent different than the way it is now right we all know that um, and if he's a, you can ask him if he need, if he's a, works for the sheriff's office, be like, well, dad, I'm going to one up you and go for the police department. <laughs> I don't, you know, not one upping anybody by doing that. <laughs> well, I'm just saying that's how you could but, say it. But to go back to what I was saying, like, you know, that that's my guess is that's why he doesn't want you to do it. But here's what I always say, say to new, new people up and coming that want to be cops. If you just go out and you make good decisions every day, you know right from wrong, don't get in trouble, then you'll have a flawless career. I mean, yeah. you should never find yourself in a, in a situation where you're in jail or getting fired or in an, in an IA. I, I mean, honestly, if you're just out making, you know, good decision making, do, do right, know your, know your policy, know case law, what you can and can't do, you will have an absolute flawless career. Um, you know, this, this industry needs good, solid people. We, we need that in for the newcomers, right? Like if we don't have that, then like, if nobody just does this job, then yeah, who is it? Warned. Right. What is the world going to turn? What, what exactly. Is the turn? So, you know, if I'm, if right. I'm your dad and, and I know you're, you're solid, you're a good kid. Um, and that was something you wanted to do, man, I, I would be, I'd be really proud if you did it. Um, because that's what that's what our community needs in law enforcement. Yeah, we need yeah. good, solid cops out there. Um, but it's hard too, because as a parent, 
Like I want I get my kids it. to become bankers and you know do a nine to five. <laughs> hey, and well, go I, home and I get and it. I live you know, a normal life. Yeah, because well, like you know, my parents are always afraid. Like, ah, oh, something's gonna happen to me. And my you know my mom, my poor mom. Um, I've had a lot of bad things happen to me. Um, you know, but I think they're still proud of what Absolutely. I do. Uh, yeah, and, dude. And knowing that if something were to actually happened to me. Let, let's say I got killed on the line of duty or whatever. Right. Like, I think we just talked about this last episode. Like everyone knows that like, I at least gave it up my 110%. And I, we all know what we're getting ourselves into, mm-hmm. into the job. And it, quite frankly, if you don't, then probably not the job for you. You should know what you're getting yourself into. But you know, if something were to happen to you at work, um, for, for I'm putting myself in like the parent shoes, I would be proud of that. I, I, I would be, I would be proud of what you did. Uh, to serve your community. Um, I would be proud of you as a parent to know that you were in a super respectable career. Um, I would be proud of that. And so I think, like you said, I think he, even if you go into this career, knowing your dad probably tells you not to, he would be proud of you. He'd yeah, probably be absolutely. super stoked. You're following his footsteps. Um, he's probably just like you, Justin said, he's a little jaded right now, but looking beyond that, man, I say go for it make your dad proud. You abs- you would make your dad proud. And, um, well, hopefully if that person that asked that question, if they apply for an agency, they would hit you up and let you know, that'd be kind of cool to see the follow up of that. It would be. Yeah. Yeah. If you're trying to get hired as a cop, shit, let us know. Um, we'll, we'll put me know. down as a referral. I get a little bit <laughs> yeah. of cash. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Hey, this dude from shots fired podcast. Yeah. Uh, yeah, no, seriously, man, go for it. Um, so I see your three references. Your first reference is <laughs> Justin from the Shots Fired podcast. What's his last name? Wow. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, his contact is, what is it? It's <laughs> Shots Fired. Shot. Yeah. 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 <laughs> hey, have your dad get a hold of us. We'll talk to him. What else you got? All right. Dude, that might actually be a cool interview. A dad that's been a cop for 20 years and a son that wants to get into it. And, and they don't want him to? Let him they debate it. They don't want it. him to. Let him debate it out. Hash yeah. it out. That would be kind of cool. I don't know. Yeah. Um, all right. Let's take a break. And when we come back, we'll, uh, we'll finish up the questions and then roll into a couple of quick little topics before we, uh, we end the episode. So we'll uh, be right back. We're back from the break. Let's uh, dive back into these questions here. Good questions, by the way. We appreciate it. Um, can you give us advice for oral boards? Again, that's that's a good question. Kind of tough. Um, I think it depends. I don't know if you're referring to trying to get hired as a law enforcement officer or you're already a law enforcement officer and... Uh, you know, you're looking to get into a specialty. I will say, I believe after episode 13, Mark and I made a YouTube video um, specifically about how to interview um, and prepare for an oral board. So if you go and and check out that video, um, it's like 10 minutes long and we kind of broke that down. But to answer the question, I would say, um, You know, well, let's, I'll start with this. If you're trying to be a police officer and you haven't got hired yet and you're going to roll into an oral board, I will say this, do as much research as you possibly can on the department that you're getting hired at. Okay. Um, if it's a city, I I would go as far as to know what specialty assignments they have. Um, you know, what square mileage the city is, who the mayor is probably, you know, dabble into who the city council members are know what the mission statement is, um, you know, no, no core values of, of the department. Um, do some ride alongs for sure. Definitely do some ride alongs. And don't be that ride along. That's like annoying. Yeah. 
you know, God, just, we should do a whole episode on that. Just <laughs> ride along. You could do a whole season on. Probably could. That's a, that is yeah. a good episode to do. Look, if you're going to do a ride along. Dress nice. Dress, dress appropriate. Yes. God damn it. You know, yes. Don't show up in jeans and a t-shirt. Dress uh, business casual. Like nice polo. Yeah. Nice pants maybe slacks stay out um, of the way ask good questions you know those questions are you know things that you want to take into the oral board with you hey you know any yeah. advice you can give me for this oral board that's firsthand knowledge from inside the department that's gold mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah um, don't be a jackass on a ride along no. don't look like a jackass on a ride along i mean there's that first and foremost but because i can promise you the hiring sergeant's gonna ask oh the, dude the, the officer that yes. you're with Hey, what do you think of this guy or gal? And they're going to be super blunt if you're an idiot asking uh, dude, stupid questions. I've kicked, <laughs> I've kicked yes, kids out of absolutely. my car like a couple. Of, I'm like, all right, we're done. I got paperwork to do. You're out. And then the Ooh. first thing I do to the sergeant, the hiring sergeant, <laughs> nope. Oh, the sergeant said it was four. I was going to ride for four hours. No, thirty minutes. Get out of my car. You're done. Get out of the car. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, don't. God damn it, don't do that. Um. Anyways. Be, per, be professional, look professional, ask professional questions if you're doing the ride along. Um, but more so than that, just do your research, do your homework on where you're going to work. You know, I mean, where, know where the department is headed, um, know where the city's headed. You know, you should know all those things. And if they don't ask you that stuff in the, in the oral board, find somewhere during the, the, the questioning to, to throw that stuff out there because then it's going to show like, dude, you went the extra mile. You did your research like that. That stuff stands out. Mm -hmm. I've been on several aura boards and yeah. uh, when people bring that stuff to the table, I mean, you can't help but be like that, that person did their research mm -hmm. like that. That person's dedicated. Now, um, if you're already within the organization and you're testing to be, you know, to get into a specialty or whatever, you know, I, I guess my best advice for that would just be like, don't be the guy that, uh, or gal that, you know, oh, the position opens up and then all of a sudden you're like interested in, in this position. And like, you know, I'll take canine for an example, right? Like, you know, you've got, you've got dudes that, that come out to training for, I would say a year, a couple years to training and they're putting in the work, uh, SWAT, same thing you know, and then you get, and then canine opens up or SWAT opens up. And then all of a sudden it's like, <gasps> Oh, Hey, can I come out to canine training and check it out? Like, yeah, sure. I, I guess. But to me, that's too late. Don't do that. Like yeah. don't, don't be last minute showing interest. You, if that's something you want to do, you should already have shown that you've shown interest. Talk. I would say, talk to all the players on the game. Um, whatever the specialty is, go talk to the people that are in the unit you know, get their feedback on it. Um, talk to the boss. You know, I think that's important. Um, you want people to know that you're interested in what you're going to do and, um, try not to make it be known after the posting has already been posted. I would say that should, that should probably be, they should already know that you're interested in the job. I would say, but I also think that ties back into the agency <laughs> to understand if you fly a position for a canine or motor officer or whatever, to judge that person for their past, not what they've done since sure, exactly since flying this position. Um, yeah. You know, I'm putting in for a motor spot. I'd be the first one to tell you, I've not written a lot of tickets over my career. I work graveyards. I do traffic stops. I contact people. But if I don't necessarily always write a ticket off that. So yeah. I think it's important to always remember what, what have they done in their career and how can they tie that into their future yeah. in this position? Um I think it starts early on in your career, to be honest, like, man, I mean, if you're just going out and doing a good job and you're staying out of trouble and you, you work hard, like that shit stands out to everybody. Uh, as it should. Yeah. As, you're right. As it should, like, let your, let your character and your work history, like show for itself. Don't try to prove anything after the job posting starts. You know, like you mentioned the motor thing, like, oh, the uh, motor position post or whatever i'm gonna go out and write 100 tickets when you've never done that before it'd be fake as fuck yeah don't do that <laughs> like, like you, you stand afterwards. out as like, fake yeah yeah but i think you could with at least with yours you can easily explain that absolutely part of your For job sure. it, i mean i've made tons of traffic stops but i don't always no. cite i advise i now know my new roles at motor officer absolutely. is it is to now cite those people mm -hmm. the traffic stop i'm already doing them yeah. I don't know. Yeah. No, I agree. And, 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 that, and that's it, right? Yeah. You know, 
but if I was to all of a sudden start changing how I do things and the way I do things, it, to me, it, it's fake. And I've, I've mm. worked with people that have done that. You know, they, they do things a certain way and then all of a sudden a spot pops up and then now they do think something different. Yeah, or if not, you've never made those traffic stops yeah. at all, that's totally different. Yeah. You're not going to get it. Yeah. But, uh, but I would agree with Kyle, you know, know the city, know the core values, know the mission statement. Yeah. Um, and tie those, tie those things into your answers. answers. Yeah. You know, don't necessarily go directly into it, but just hit those, think of them as hot buttons. You know, try to hit a hot button for every single question that's asked. There's, you know, websites all across the internet of oral board questions. Uh, the other thing that I would mention is to, as you're reviewing these questions, it sounds funky, but talk out loud. Yes, agreed. Talk out loud. Yeah. Don't, you know, find a quiet place in your house. Talk out loud. Actually say the words out loud. Because if you're sitting there talking in your head, you're going to end up talking in circles. Um, say it out loud. It sticks better in your head. You can kind of go back, even if you need to record it. You know, how was this answer? Um, maybe get a partner. This is a this is a long career. You know, do your due diligence. Do your homework. Um, become great at it before you even start it. Yeah. I think your interview starts day one. You constantly have to be preparing for that position or any position and, and communicating with those people. They should know that you're interested in the spot well before the yeah. stop pot even posts. You should be doing everything you can to try and work over their temporary duty assignments, yeah. volunteer constantly and talk with those people. And then before it even posts, I would recommend, which I did, is you ask those people that are in those positions, can you do a mock interview? Can you ask me four questions? Call me in at a certain time and ask me questions and I will answer those questions and then have them record it. Put iPad or something in there and record it and then do mock interviews because then you're really going to get legit feedback. If you came in, if the two of us, if you're interested in position, you said, can you do a mock interview? Totally. I'll come up with some questions. And really, you have so much access to information out there right now with even internal departments, external the internet, you should not really be surprised on how to answer a question. The wording might be a little different, but the answering is basically gonna be the same. Mm -hmm. You should not be surprised. If you are surprised in an interview, you're not prepared. Yeah. yeah. You're not prepared. And if that sounds dumb to you, hey, how bad do you want it? That's that's just what it comes down to, like how bad do you want it? And I will say this, that, and this is very important. If you don't get the position, okay, do not throw a fit. Mm -hmm. Do not talk shit at the department. Um, don't throw a temper tantrum. I recently just put in for a specialty assignment as a sergeant. I didn't get it. Um, it's all good. Like, was I upset about it? Yes. Can I have those conversations on the side with my buddies? Absolutely. Am I going to show that at the department and throw a tantrum and, you know, just talk shit about everybody vocally? Hell no. Because I'll tell you right now, if you don't get a spot, but maybe you're looked at as like, well, he might be next in line for this or, or whatever, right? There's other plans for you within the organization. If you act like that, you're done. Like you're not getting anything uh, that they will remember that. Um, that's part of your interview. That is, that is, that's a right? really good judge and of some character. People, and some people will say, well, that's a game and that's bullshit. Okay. It, you know what, dude, you're in a career where <laughs> that matters. It is a game. All it's that a game. stuff matters. Be humble. Yeah, dude, it's just, it's all good. Like try harder next time. Ask, try to debrief with whoever was on the or board or whoever the boss is making a decision. Like, Hey, why? Hopefully you can have that, that conversation with them at a debrief and like, why didn't I get that position? And maybe they'll throw you a nugget of like, Hey, work on this, whatever. And maybe they'll just bullshit you and come up with some BS excuse. Like why you didn't get it. Like I've had that. that that's fine. I think they're going to do but, that. I don't think you should even pose that question because I think you put that, the interviewee or, or whatever in a weird position by saying, why didn't I get it? Cause we know they're not going to be able to say it. And well, and regardless, like you didn't get it. So just move on. But like, don't, but, but don't ask what about it. Ask what did I do really good? Like what stood out? And then what did, what did, what stood out that was not good about my interview? Where can I improve? Yeah. I, yeah. I will, I will go I with will, that. I will admit this. So, prior to becoming a dog handler. So back in 2014, when I got the position for three years prior to that, I was going to trainings every week on my own time 
working graveyard, sleeping two hours, going to training, taking dog bites, getting money donated to the team. Like, dude, I did a lot for our canine team because that's I really wanted that spot. And I did that for about two and a half, three years. The position was flown. I thought I was going to get it. And somebody else got it over me. Good dude. I'm, I'm buddies with, he doesn't, you know, he doesn't even work for us anymore, but he gets it over me. I will honestly say like, I, I, there was so much buildup to, to testing for that spot because like you guys know, like canine spots don't come available oh. every day. Right. And finally was like, Oh my God, this is my shot. And then I didn't get it, dude. F- the first thing I did, I text the guy that got the position and I congratulated him, told him that I was stoked for him. I literally drove home that morning from working Gray's dude. I cried. I was so upset, like I cried about not getting that spot because I felt like I'd worked so hard and I was so passionate about wanting that spot. Uh, I was devastated. The very next day, I was already scheduled to go be a decoy for a huge city event where I was supposed to take a dog bite. City council members were supposed to be there. The chief was going to be there. All of our command staff was going to be there, a bunch of members of the public uh, community. And dude... I, I showed up bright early in the morning, the very next day, they were all shocked that I showed up because they were like, well, you didn't get it. So they were, they thought that I just wasn't going to show up. Right. And I was there and, uh, man, I caught the dog and I acted totally normal. And I remember the chief pulled me aside and he was like, that, that takes a lot of courage to you. He knew I was devastated. Yeah. He knew how bad I wanted it to be there the next day to fucking do what I just had done the last three years and still didn't get the job. That said a lot. And six months later I got the position. So it's a good judge of character. You cannot agree. But I guarantee he was like, fuck that. I'm not going. (laughs) I was like, (laughs) God damn it. Yeah. No, I mean, dude, I I, I was, I was fucking devastated. I'm not going to lie, but I still went. And um, because I had committed to that, I'm not going to like let these guys down in front of all these, like who else was going to catch the dog if I didn't show up. Right. So like I went and Um, all the handlers on the team were super cool. Um, they lifted me up and, and, um, they're like, dude, you're going to get it next time. That was literally lifted you literally. I was pretty small, (laughs) but, um, it stood out amongst the command staff. Right. And they recognized it. And like I said, you never know when another spot's going to come available. Like six months later, I got the position and I'm so glad I did that because I think had I thrown in the towel and been like, F this, F those guys, (laughs) dude, I don't even know where I'd be in my career. I wouldn't have got it. I know that no. for a fact. No. Yeah. So remember that too. Okay. If you don't get it the first go around or even second go around, dude, keep if, trying. If that's what you want to do, you're a good example of that. Six times. Exactly. Tested 12, 12 times or stuff. Six times or swat. Then I realized that interviewing is a skill. It is. It's a craft. For sure. Yeah. For sure. All what, right. What else you got? Um, here's a, this one may, well, you guys can chime in on this more of kind of a canine thing, but, Mm. um, how to set up a perimeter for a canine track. Um, like what should perimeter officers specifically do? Should they have their lights on or off? Um, should perimeter shift if the track goes outside their perimeter, (laughs) et cetera. Um, I'm going to kick that off just because it's more canine related. Number one, I didn't have a tracking dog. Um, here on the West coast, kind of a rare thing. Um, it's not a huge, huge tracking dogs. Aren't, aren't really what we do out here on the West coast. Um, there are, there are a handful of guys that do it. Um, but I know it's a lot of work, but regardless of whether you're doing a track or just an area search, um, perimeters are single handedly. I think the most important thing to do to catch a bad guy. And you have to do it immediately. So if you have someone fleeing or whatever, like the first thing somebody should be thinking about is perimeter. And generally what we preach is if you're the furthest from the scene, meaning you're not going to be first, second, third one there, um, you know, you know, you're going to be late to the party, pull over, pull up your map, whether you have it on your computer or if you, I guess if you don't have access to that, you, you probably have a smartphone map, map out where, where they're at and you call the perimeter. Um, that's generally how that should go. Um, so if you're furthest away, you should already know that you should be calling the perimeter. Um, now if a dog is tracking or doing a search and this happens, you know, 
uh, quite often. Um, maybe a suspect breaks the perimeter or maybe we get intel where... Somebody we, calls in and says, hey, somebody's yeah, in my backyard. Outside the perimeter, Outside right? the perimeter. For sure. You, sh you should always be able to manipulate and adjust your perimeter as needed. Uh, what I would say to that is um, if you're a perimeter officer, like you're a perimeter officer, that is your job. Um, get the hell out of your car, search the area around you so that you're not, you know, hiding or taking cover near the suspect because we've had that happen. Um, you know, so get out of your car, uh, take cover somewhere around your car. Um, and, uh, you know, make sure you're searching that, that immediate area, but you're not searching outside of that area. Right. So you're not out kind of like, you're not out on your own, just like checking trash cans and sheds and front yards and shit. Like, don't do that. Um, just check the immediate area where you're going to be posting up at. But, um, you know, I, yeah, yes, you should have your lights, sirens. You want to be as mo as visible as you possibly can. Um, because the whole objective of uh, being a perimeter is you want to bed these guys down. So, <clears throat> you know, the theory is, is if someone's running from the cops and they see a bunch of lights, you know, let's say it's at, let's at nighttime, right. When you can see this stuff, um, they see lights bouncing off of buildings or they hear sirens or whatever, like they're going to see or hear that. And they're going to think there's more, more of you than there really are. Yeah. Um, not to be giving away tactics, but, <laughs> but the point is, is that, yeah, you want to be visible. You want to be loud. Um, I tell guys on perimeter spots every, every so often I might say like, Hey, trip your siren or whatever. Right. Like just, just be loud and visible. Um, we're, we're not trying to be sneaky. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like, um, you're kind of defeating the purpose at that point. Uh, psychologically it's been proven time and time again that when suspects are in a heightened state of fear or, or scared of being caught, uh, the second they see red and blue lights or hear a siren or, or whatever, um, they'll more oftentimes than not immediately hunker down. And then, and then that's when you can form a search team or get a canine there and, and try to go find them. But so be visible, be loud. Don't try to. That, that, that's the purpose of, of a, of a perimeter. You're going to overwhelm this person with lights and sirens to the point to where they stop moving and they settle in. Yeah. Um, we don't want them to keep moving. And, and I agree. Get out of your car, leave your lights on, find a shadow, find a shadowy area, yeah. sit there and pay attention. You know, listen, you, leave your cell phone in your pocket, be cognizant of your surroundings. You know, people have motion lights in their backyards area. Are those turning on? Why are they turning on? Listen for dogs barking. Mm -hmm. Listen for garbage cans. You know, people. Fence boards breaking. Fence boards breaking. All these things that are not normal during nighttime. I'm speaking graveyards because I've never really worked day shift, so I can't tell you what they do. <laughs> yeah, uh, that's true. But pay, pay attention to what's going on around you and let your partners know. If something's not yeah. right, let your partners know. Hey, just had a side light turn on at, you know, one, two, three, four Main Street. Um. Yeah, it, it, it puts that information out there, memorializes it within the system. Mm -hmm. um, and then it lets people know what's going on, where your little bubble is. And, and to capitalize on what Justin just said, don't be afraid to call that, put that stuff out over the radio because a, a minor thing like a dog barking, a <clears throat> fence board breaking, a motion light turning on, that could be very crucial information. And if you're not putting that out, you, you may be missing something. Um, now, with that said, if that's going on and you voice that, that doesn't mean everyone breaks from their perimeter position and busts over to where you're, where you're at. Like you have to maintain, um, your perimeter spot. You know, you cannot, you cannot venture away from that unless you are told to do so. Um, you know, so, but it is very important to put that stuff out on the radio. Um, canine handlers, if you're listening, uh, I know you guys know that that, you should be telling your folks like, Hey, if you guys are seeing or hearing these things, please let me know. doesn't mean you're going to go right over to that spot and search it, but you should be storing that in the back of your mind. Um, you know, okay, maybe I need to start working my search towards this way. Um, but I, I think what you say is, it's huge. W when you're on a perimeter, your responsibility is perimeter eyes and ears. Yeah. And you need to have the discipline not to leave mm -hmm. and, when you hear those no little noises and you see those things, you should be voicing that because I was a part of those teams that were on the inner circle that were searching 
and you're communicating with hand signals and different movements and you're making a little bit of noise and you're pausing and like there's a lot more going on with your search team and you can't hear all the time what's going two yards down so you rely on those people and yeah. when someone says hey this side motion light just turned on and they give the address and you're that officer that gives that might think it's totally irrelevant mm -hmm. but to the search team that's like hey, everything that we've seen so far is consistent and that is the direction we're going. That's good information. We want that. Totally, yeah. It's not your job to check that. Can no, 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 do not. It's not your yeah. be like, hey, I got a motion light going off here. Don't. I'm going to go check it. No, yeah. Yeah. stay where you're at. Keep your perimeter spot. The other thing is perimeter size. That That's super important, right? Because you can go too small. You can go too big. It's kind of like a Goldilocks thing, right? Um, so keep in mind, how many units do you have? Yeah. How far the way, you know, most, most CAD systems now can map, kind of see where people are at. Um, the first perimeter you're going to call is probably going to be nerve wracking. Oh, for sure. Air, You're screwed up. Telling yeah. people where to go. Um, someone's going to say, you should have done this. You should have done that. It's okay. Yeah. But if you know that you're the furthest away, step up to the challenge, Yeah. pull over, get into a safe spot, call out the perimeter. Um, and I would recommend calling out one position at a time. Yeah, good you point. Know, hey, yeah. you know, give me a unit at this location and then wait for somebody to key up for that. Yeah. And then give a next location. Yeah. So give it so on and so forth. If you all of a sudden you blurt out four different spots where you want to send people. That's um, stupid. Yeah. You it's too convoluted. Go yeah. People get confused. Streets yeah. get, you know, radio traffic gets covered up by sirens. And yeah. So one location at a time, let somebody key up, let somebody take it and then give it from there. Yeah. yeah. That's have, have good radio brevity too. I mean, that's another pet peeve. If you don't have something important to say on the radio, don't, don't say it. But that, that was a really good question. Yeah, no, that is a good question. That means, um, <laughs> either they've experienced that or, or something, but <laughs> somebody uh, screwed something. Yeah, yeah. maybe. <clears throat> yeah. So thanks for that. Hopefully that answers that, that question. Um, all right. I think this is the last one, last one that will answer. Um, so basically this guy's in the process of becoming a police officer. His first day is next week. Uh, he wants to know he's 21 years old. And he wants to know what he should expect his first year. I think Justin will, well, we can all speak to it, but I mean, as far as you're an FTO, like what, what advice would you give to somebody? Be a sponge. Yeah. I mean, when I was 21 years old, I can tell you right now, I was not ready to be put on a gun belt and be a cop. Yeah, um, I was 20. Yeah. Holy <laughs> shit. Um, now he's 22. <laughs> 23. Um, you know, be a sponge, absorb that information. I can't tell, I can't stress that enough to you. absorb it, learn it, understand it. Um, ask questions. Yeah. Um, there, there's so much that is learned in your first year. You're going into this job <laughs> with what you pull out of the Academy, which, which is when, bare minimum when, when it comes to actual practicality on the streets, it's nothing. basically nothing. Yeah. It's nothing. Um, but I can't stress enough to absorb that information because it's very important that once you have it, you retain that because if we're FTOs or corporals or senior lead officers are having to teach you the same thing over and over, uh, that means you're not learning new stuff. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I would say, you know, that that's young. I started at 20 and, um, not to belabor, you know, what you said, because I think everything you just said was pr pretty spot on. Um, I don't know, treat, treat people with respect. Um, you know, treat your senior officers with respect. You got to be the sponge. You don't know shit coming out of the academy. You can't replicate scenario. I don't care what scenarios you did in the academy. <laughs> um, you can't replicate real life, and you're going to learn that really, really quickly. On, um, I, I, w I would just say like expect uh, to feel like you don't know anything, and um, it's going to take you. It takes a, f a couple years to a few years to really get a good grasp of this job, right? Yeah. I mean. Um, so I wouldn't even be looking at specialties. I wouldn't be looking at anything like that. Your first probably th one to three years, I would just be looking at how to become a really good patrol cop. Your first three years. That's, that's what you should be focusing on. One other thing, if I may. No, okay. <laughs> just kidding. you're going to screw something up. Oh, for sure. You're going to mess up. You're going to mess up a traffic stop. You're going to mess up a consensual contact little things. On a pet stop. Yeah. You're going to mess up. Um, I cannot stress enough. Don't let that be your only contact. So if you mess up a traffic stop, a bad contact with the driver or a bad detent, whatever it may be, do another one, do another one, do another one, do another one until you get it right. Yeah. If you stop only on that bad contact, that's all, that's all an FTO has to judge you on. 
mm, you know, to grade point. you on. You know, he did two traffic stops and he fucked up both. Ah, you good know, point. He did two traffic stops. And at the start of the shift, he fucked up both. We talked about it. We discussed where he messed up and what he needed to do. Then he ended the shift with two more and got a felony arrest and pulled a gun off the street. Um, so don't don't stop what you're doing. Stay eager to learn. Understand you're going to mess up and continue to improve. Yeah, I I take it a little different. You guys had good points, so I'm, I'll just go a different direction. And I think what you could expect is some things that I mean I could I related to is your uniform and your gear is going to be uncomfortable because you're not going to be used to it. Yeah. What you wear in the academy is not what you wear in the streets. Your setup and all that is probably going to change and just kind of expect that. I think you should have your duty belt set the best you can, but expect that it's going to be uncomfortable. Sitting in the car is going to be weird. I think you could expect that everybody is going to stare at you. Mm -hmm. And it's not because they are eye-fucking you or they don't like you. Some people are, but some of it is people are looking at the car itself. No one gives a shit who's in the car, but they're looking at the car because it's cool looking. Yeah. Like they're just because they're looking at you doesn't mean they're staring at you personally. Mm -hmm. I think everyone's gonna be looking at you. In Starbucks, they're gonna be looking you up and down. So how you dress, the way you walk, all of that, the yeah. way you, and where you put your hands, everybody is watching and analyzing everything. So you're gonna be uncomfortable. It's gonna be yeah. very weird. And, and and at that age, you know, how you conduct yourself in uniform, like you just said, because everybody's going to be staring at you. You are a direct reflection of your city yeah. and the community that you work in. So remember that you're not acting like your typical 21 year old, you know, um, with his, hanging out with his buddies at, at a store or whatever, when you're out in public in uniform, like you're professional all the time. Um, you know, you, you can't act like an idiot. The way you speak uh, to people is, is important. Um, I think you could expect watched. if you're going to write a ticket for some reason in your first couple of days that it's going to look like you drank three rock stars and didn't eat for an entire day because your hand is going to be scribbly. It's going to look like you were really scared because you were nervous. So your handwriting is weird. Well, actually, you know what? When I wrote handwriting, what, what handwritten, handwritten tickets. That's that. yeah, we don't do really that funny. <laughs> <laughs> it's funny. As I was saying that, I was like, I don't Shit. think they handwrite tickets anymore. Yeah, no, it's all, it's all like crazy. All right. Do not tell people that it's your first day or they're my first week or yeah. <laughs> do not. I had a trainee do that. I'm like, stop that right now. That's funny. Just tell them that's irrelevant. We're here for this. Yeah. You know, don't yeah, be like, don't... Oh, I've only been a cop for two days. So let me solve this problem for yeah. you. Yeah. Yeah. I think being compassionate, but you could expect to be weird to go. I think you could expect to go into people's houses and be absolutely blown away at what people have in their houses and how clean and how dirty. And you'll probably notice that dirty houses, a vacuum has never been seen. <laughs> you have a new um, reference on what a dirty house is. Yeah. 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 I've gone into people's homes like, oh, excuse the mess. And I'm like, trust me, yeah. this yeah. is not messy. When you're walking over literally piles, like, I mean, ankle deep piles of clothing mm. in the hallway dog feces oh. and beer. I, I went into one where it was the the carpet was so saturated with cat urine and dog urine that when i got went outside i was leaving wet footprints that's disgusting yeah. that's you should literally never wear your uniform i know there's agencies that do it but you should never wear your uniform or your boots in, in your, your personal house. car or your house yeah, don't, ever yeah ever don't do that Ever. Or I, if you do have to do that, I would disinfect them or something before you get in your car. You should the not. Garage. There's no reason. Yeah, garage, that's it. There's yeah. no reason to introduce that to your normal Absolutely living. And not. if you're a canine guy listening to this and you're letting your dog jump on your bed and your couch and all that, think of all the nasty shit your dog also goes into cars, houses. I mean, backyard. Like, like yeah. it's gross. Okay. So if you guys forget <laughs> about that, like, remember your, remember that and uh, bathe, your, bathe your dog. I always we always, I try to do it at least once a week. Um, cause that's disgusting too. So I think you could yeah. expect to see people at their worst moments because they are calling nine one one and people are going to want to touch you and hug you. And you're going to have to read that if you can do it or not, but little kids are going to yeah. be disgusting and gross and covered in dirt and filth. And it's going to be heartbreaking to see it, but they're going to want to come up and hug you and grab your leg and touch you and look at all your stuff. Yeah. And don't, I would say, let them do it. Yeah. Don't be Absolutely. a robot. I yeah. think that's the biggest thing in, in society yeah. now with cops is like, what we don't want to see from cops anymore is like, we're don't be a robot. 
Just yeah. be a human, like be, be you in a uniform and be professional. Like the whole robotic thing is like, so we're, some we're, of the most memorable events that I've had while in law enforcement have nothing to do with putting handcuffs on anybody. Yeah. It has to yeah, do with probably being there with somebody during their yeah. absolute worst moments that they can remember in life. Yeah. yeah. And you know, whether it's holding their hand or hugging their child or helping them through an event that is so impactful that they feel that they need to get the police involved. Yeah. Yeah. And I think it's important too, for us to remember too, as, as you advance, advance on in your career and years go on, like your interaction with one person that day may be their only interaction with the police once in their whole life. Okay. Albeit we we're bouncing from call to call to call. And to us, it's, it's, Oh, I've seen this a thousand times or a hundred times or whatever, like, and it may be no big deal, big deal to you. But remember that when you're dealing with people and they're at their worst, you, that might be their only encounter with the cops their entire life. They're going to remember that forever. Um, I think it's important to remind yourself of that, you know, that all, albeit we do it every day, all day, uh, they don't. And so, um, you know, keep that in the back of your head, head as well. They do remember you. And especially if you work in a smaller, smaller beat or smaller neighborhood, everybody that you interact will remember you, but you're not going to remember them because you're going to see a ton of people, but you're, they're going to remember you. So that's a, you got to be good. One thing that I would also recommend is when, during your time in training, have a short introduction of yourself so that as you see people in the hallway, Cause they don't know who the fuck you are. Yes. They're true. Just be like this. Who's this fucking new guy? Yeah. You're the fucking new guy. Have an introduction. Step up. Like, hi, I'm Justin. Pleasure to meet you. I started here in July on patrol and it's, you know, whatever, yeah. right? Something out, learn it at home. Um, and don't step up and introduce yourself. Yeah. Rather than just sit there and, you know, yeah. look like a deer in headlights. Yeah. No, I agree. You could expect to sit in the front row. I think. Uh, Absolutely. Uh, briefing right at the front oh. middle by the podium. Yep. You should just go there. And if someone's there, <laughs> yeah. you should say, would you mind if I sat here? <laughs> I wouldn't even sit. Good, good I would point. stand. Yeah. Oh, Start fuck. with standing until somebody tells you you can sit. Yeah. And, and uh, I mean, that's a good point too. What, it's respectable. It's when res it, because you might be sitting in some, someone's chair. That's a great point. We all, we all are creatures. I have my chair. That's I had my, my chair, chair when I worked patrol. Yeah. You're and creatures of habit. It's mine. And, don't sit there. Yeah. Respectable. I, I actually really I like stand that. Stand in a corner with your, with your book in your hand until your FTO tells you where to sit. Yeah. yeah. Have your notebook out, take notes during briefing, write stuff down and ask questions. Um, be prepared <laughs> to get asked questions by senior officers or, or the supervisor. You know, don't, don't make your FTO look stupid. And then um, if you can't answer it, cause you don't know it, I think you should just say, you know what? I don't know the answer to that. I will find it yeah. and I'll get back to you at the next roll call Absolutely. and just or, fucking take or control. later, later, later. Absolutely. Tonight I'll get back yeah. To you. Instead of trying to fumble fuck your way. Cause mm -hmm. then you're, you're going to yeah. ride your ass. Yeah. Yeah. There's so many good luck. Ugh. So many things to talk about. <laughs> mm. I didn't get any of this when I was new. By the way. Yeah. Congrats. Yeah. Let yeah. us know after week one, let us know. Yeah. Good stuff. Um, so that, that let's wrap up the questions on that. If we didn't get to your question or if you guys have questions, please hit us up. Um, we will, we'll answer them, um, either in this setting or we'll message you or get back to you, uh, on social media or, or whatever. So, um, there was only a couple other things I want to discuss just before we wrap this up. That was, um, the unfortunate, um, helicopter crash that happened in Huntington beach, uh, down, down in SoCal. Uh, just a couple days ago, you know, their, their helicopter went down and, um, one of the officers inside the helicopter lost his life. That's, that's tragic. Um, the other survived. It'll be interesting to hear the story behind that. You know, I've seen a lot of questions being asked, whether the news, social media or whatever about, you know, why, because it happened, they were assisting Newport beach PD, which is a nearby city. Uh, why were they? assisting them if they don't work there and yada, yada, yada. It's simple. Like when you're an asset like that of an air unit, you're, you're helping everybody. Like you're not just stuck to your one department. You're, you're assisting agencies all over. Um, we use them daily all the time. every day we're using outside air units, you know? So, um, that is a very common thing. 
Um, you know, so, uh, hats off to, to, to that officer's family. Um, I'm obviously more to, more to come with that. And then ironically enough, we're having a, um, the tactical flight officer for the air unit here locally on our next show, um, which will be pretty cool to get their insight on eyes from the sky and their perspective of things. And, um, I think that'll be very educational. Um, the gentleman we're having on is, um, I think he's hands down one of the best tactical flight officers in the region. He's phenomenal. Um, he's got a lot of experience, so we're excited for that. I do apologize. We are going to miss next week. Um, I'll be in Connecticut teaching a couple classes there for New Haven police department. So I'm pretty excited about that. So I'll be traveling to Connecticut and New York out on the East coast next week. So we won't, we won't have a podcast for you, but, um, when I come back, we'll, uh, we'll kick off, kick off our next show with, with that. So pretty exciting. Um, but gosh, anything else? Crazy. Yeah. want to end on the, that officer that lost life in Huntington beach BD yeah. that crashed in, in Newport that marks this year near the end of February to be 20 officers that have died this year already. That's insane. When we started this year with the podcast, we really talked about officer safety and things to consider and that in itself, some things you can't control, but right now, what is, I mean, we pre did the math. That's close to 120 deaths right now. And that is astronomical. Yeah. So everything you can do to try and exercise and to be safe out there, you look at just pulling up the numbers, uh, six this year have passed away from crashing their own patrol cars. Five have been shot. Uh, one has had a heart attack. Two have been hit by a car and then three others have been purposely hit by their car. Um, and then a couple other ones. So massive numbers of deaths in law enforcement this year already. So please be careful, exercise all of your tactics, pay attention to your surroundings, watch your buddies back. Uh, and then also to add to that, there's been, I think we said, was it five? Uh, I'm sorry, I think one, two, four canine canines that have passed away, and we've kind of uh, talked off to the side. At least two of those have been what we believe to be preventable. Half of those already. So, yeah, you know, I, the the canine thing, you know, irks me just because when I read some of these stories of canines being killed, uh, the dogs specifically, obviously, it, it pisses me off because. Um, I, I think it's just handler error sending their dogs on these suicide missions. And you, like you guys, you got to understand you handlers out there. Like if you know, somebody has a weapon, a edge weapon or a firearm. Okay. The, the dog's out of play. Like it's not a less lethal call. Exactly. So there's other tools that we have, uh, that we can utilize. Um, you know, first of all, if it's a weapon call and, and, and you know, the guy has a weapon, like it's, it's weapon on weapon. We're not, we're not screwing around with, with less lethal stuff. If, if you, uh, especially involving a firearm, right. And in one of the cases I just read, um, I think the canines, the, the dog's name was Maya, um, in Salt Lake County dog was killed. And, and the news article is pretty vague. So I'm not, I don't want to jump to conclusions, but from what it says is the guy jumped out of the car and was running with a gun in his hand and somehow the dog gets shot and killed. I, I can only read into that and think that the handler sent the dog on the guy with the gun and ultimately the dog gets shot and killed. Okay. We can't do that. That is not a dog call. All right. I can't reiterate that enough. I've said that so many episodes. Um, stop getting in the mindset of just because someone's biteable, all you're thinking is deploying your dog on somebody. You can't do that. You got to think outside the box and being a good dog handler, you have to have that discipline. You have to know what is a dog call and what is not a dog call. If, if you guys aren't training that, I don't know what, I don't know what the hell's going on, but you got to start training that. Um, I'm not going to sit here and blabber the topic. I'm just going to say like, if you're a dog handler and you're listening to this show, please use your head when it comes to deploying your dog. All right. Um, it's not that hard. Okay. Um, stop sending your dog on these suicide missions. You're not accomplishing anything other than your dog's getting killed. 
Um, and it, it, you know, quite frankly, it, it pit fucking pisses me off and, and talking to other guys in the industry that are on the same page as me is like, it, it's pissing, it pisses them off too. And we all, we've all come to the same conclusion on that. It doesn't need to happen. Um, with that said, as far as, you know, a lot of cops have been shot and killed this year. And then, you, you know, even the canine thing, like if historically, if you go back and look at a lot of, um, incidents where cops are shot and killed, a lot of this stuff is preventable. Mm -hmm. It really is. And I don't want to be the asshole to say that because I'm not, I don't want to down, you know, I don't want to like talk bad on anybody that's lost their life or, or whatever. But the reality is guys to learn from this shit is a lot of this stuff is preventable and using good officer safety and good tactics and not rushing into things is going to save your life. Now, like you said, there are certain things that are not preventable. All right. Being ambushed, all, all those things, right. You're, you can't prevent that. Um, two but, things that come to mind are complacency and success. People become complacent yeah. and they become, they base things off of past successes. You know, I've mm -hmm. done this so many times and this is the way I've done it. And I've been successful, meaning I haven't been hurt and the problems mm -hmm. have been solved. So that's how I'm going to continue to do it. Yeah. Whether or not they sacrificed officer safety, but they've still reached that end goal. Um, the other thing I, I teach trainees and it kind of ties into that last question that we had about the first year and then kind of ties into this is if something's uncomfortable, recognize that it's uncomfortable and what can you do to make that situation more comfortable? Mm -hmm. If there's nothing you can do, at least you've acknowledged this is a shit out situation and it's uncomfortable. So I'll give an example. You're on a perimeter, you're out of your car and you're not in cover. It's uncomfortable standing in no man's land. So can I make this better? Yes. I can go behind this tree. I can go behind this car. Maybe that's not there, but at least you recognized it and understand that this is a, now this situation has been upped a little bit because of where I'm at and what I'm doing. Yeah. Yeah. And, and understand people's body language and behavior and, and know like what's a red flag and what's not. I mean, it's, it, it's going to save your ass one day. I'm telling you, um, being able to recognize it about people and, um, you know, know what's, what's normal behavior and what's not normal behavior. Right. Um, start picking up on that stuff when you're out on calls. Uh, and like I've said a hundred times, you know, what, what builds complacency, it's, it's one word and it's success. Like you just said it, um, being successful too many times is going to build complacency. Um, our jobs as cops is to be able to recognize that and, and break that, you know, um, I, I hate to see all these cops getting killed. And what, what frustrates me even more is when you watch a lot of these body cam videos out there, like damn, like a lot of them are preventable and you're just like, yeah, he didn't have to do that. Yep. Um, I, I, again, I hate to say that, but, um, it's true. And so at the heart of this podcast is kind of trying to pump out information to help guys and gals be safe out there. You know, I mean, that's all we have to, to rely on in this job. So with that said, do you guys have anything else to wrap it up? No, oh, thank you for having me. It's fun. Yeah. Thanks for, thanks for cruising yeah. on, dude. Um, thanks for being here. For those of you watching, Billy will be back next week, or I guess it'll be two weeks from now. But um, thanks again, Justin, for jumping on. Um, appreciate it. Maybe we'll try to throw in a special guest every now and then to kind of mix it up a little bit. Yeah. Get different Sounds people's good. perspectives on stuff. Yeah. It's, it's nice. Um, so um, we'll wrap it up with this episode. You guys be safe out there. I, don't, I know we say that every time. Um, yeah, but we mean it. Yeah, hug, we, hug your loved ones. Absolutely. Yeah. Be safe. Be smart. And uh, just just make good decisions. Um, and then we'll end it on a, on a toast, on a cheers. Cheers to every everybody out there. Um, have a safe, good work week. Later. See ya. Have a good night. Hey, we're out of shot fired. Copy additional shot fired. Shot fired. Shot fired. Shooting at us. Shooting at officer.